Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Phillips, and I'm the Dean of the College of Law, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Cronkite Memorial Lecture in Public Law as part of the McKercher LLP Lecture Series at the College of Law. Uh, as we gather here today, we acknowledge we're on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, and we pay our respects to the Métis First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. I would like to begin by thanking McKercher LLP for their generous sponsorship of our lecture series, which allows the college to continue to present a wide range of informative, educational, and entertaining speakers to the law school community. The FC Cronkite KC, or QC as he was, Memorial Lectures were inaugurated in November 1978 to honor Frederick Clinton Cronkite, who was Dean of the College of Law from 1929 to 1961. Good heavens. <laughs> I can't, imagine, I can't imagine doing it for that long. Wow, wow, he deserved a lecture in his name after that. And, and keep probably more than that, actually. In keeping with the former dean's primary field of interest, the lectures emphasized the area of public law. The first of these biennial lectures was delivered by the Honorable Emmett M. Hall, an alumnus of our college and former Supreme Court of Canada Justice. The Cronkite Lecture has also been delivered by Barry Strayer, another alumni of this school who helped write the, the text of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Honorable Justice Walter Tarnopolsky, who is the founding dean of the University of Windsor Law School. The Honorable Justice Rosalie Abella. Uh, Mr. Justice Lorne Sosson, who is dean of Osgood Hall Law School and now is on the Ontario Court of Appeal. And Richard Pound uh, of the International Olympic Committee, to name just a few. I would now like to welcome Colin Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld, KC. Colin is a partner at the Saskatoon office of McKercher and with experience in construction contracts, tendering, construction litigation, dispute resolution, and professional discipline. Colin. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, and we at McKercher are very happy and, and honored to be part of this, uh, sponsoring these lectures. It's a very important, uh, serves a very important role at the university, and we're happy to be a part of that. Uh, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce uh, Stephen Pelos. Uh, Stephen is a widely recognized economist with nearly 40 years of experience in financial markets, forecasting, and economic policy, including 35 years in the public sector. Prior to joining Osler, Stephen was the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada. Could probably use you there now, maybe, but <laughs> interesting times. Canada's central bank. Stephen was governor of the bank for seven years after having previously spent 14 years there during 1981 to 1985, occupying, occupying a range of increasingly senior positions. Stephen is also the author of the book titled The Next Age of Uncertainty, how the world can adapt to a riskier future that maps out the powerful economic forces that are shaping our future and the ideas that will allow us to master them. Prior to joining the Bank of Canada, Stephen spent 14 years at Export Development Canada as the Chief Economist from 1999 to 2008, Head of Lending from 2008 to 2011, and finally as President and CEO from 2011 to 2013. He also spent four years at BCA Research where he was the managing editor of the International Bank Credit Analyst, one of their flagship publications. Stephen is an honorary certified international trade professional and a graduate of Columbia University's senior executive program. He has been a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, DC, and at the Economic Planning Agency in Tokyo, Japan. He's a frequent speaker and writer and has taught economics at the University of Western Ontario, Concordia University, and Queen's School of Business. At Osler, Stephen provides clients with his significant expertise and strategic guidance regarding the financial system, trade, and economic policy, both domestically and on a global scale. Please join me to welcome Stephen. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, very kind, and for inviting me to be here uh, today. And thanks for, for being here yourselves. It's truly an honor to, uh, to deliver the Cronkite Lecture here at, the, uh, at U Saskatchewan. Now, that list of past speakers that I uh, just mentioned, that's pretty humbling. Uh, not least because many of those people were, of course, esteemed members of the legal community, which I'm not. Uh, but I do work at Osler, so I guess that makes me part of the legal services community. 
Um, and, uh, and of course, I, and I do have a couple of Doctor of Laws degrees, which you know don't really count, but, but still, this says law right in there. Uh, I want to talk today about some of the fundamental shifts that are underway in our economic and political context. Now, these shifts, I expect to have profound consequences for decision making, whether by individuals or firms uh, or governments. And since we all make major decisions in our lives within a common legal framework, often with direct involvement of legal professionals and the judiciary, these shifts that I'm talking about do have the potential to strain the capabilities, possibly the foundations of the legal system. So let's begin with the observation that, first of all, it's human nature to frame our personal thinking with reference to past major economic events. Now, you've all heard it. As a young economist, I started my own narratives with reference to the great inflation of the 70s, that, that huge period. It was broken by the wrenching recession of 81 to 82. By the way, for you young folks, mortgage rates approached 20% during that one. Well, the events on 9-11 were a defining day for many of us. People begin a story with, I remember 9-11. You know, we must endure long security lineups at airports today, 20 years later, because of what happened that day. So you just contemplate the number of person hours that can never be retrieved as a consequence. The economic cost, what economists call appropriately deadweight loss, has been colossal and continues to grow today. And now, well, the COVID pandemic has shoved all of those past references aside. People talk about pre-COVID with almost as much reverence as before the common era. Now, even so, more recently, COVID has suddenly taken a backseat to Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a defining event. Now, what all these reframing events have in common is that they were almost inconceivable when they happened. And their occurrence changed our view of risk from then on. Now what I've just said there is, you know, something that's life altering like that, that constitutes a black swan. That is the definition actually of a black swan defined by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Now it's not surprising that we frame our oral history with black swans because it's human. What is surprising is that the number and scale of black swans seems to be growing through time, especially when they aren't even supposed to happen at all. They are very, very low probability events. And it's not just that black swans are happening more frequently, it's that black swan events usually are catalysts to something more. They set in motion a series of consequences that can magnify and endure, such as the events of 9-11. Now the catalyst itself could be anything. It could be anything from a stock market crash to, now we know, a bat from Wuhan to a lunatic from Moscow. It can be all of these things. But the consequences depend on the underlying forces that are already in place, the ones that are acting on the economy. So let me just illustrate this idea with an example. A quick reading of economic history will suggest to you that the Vienna stock market crash of 1873 led directly to the Victorian Depression. This was a global economic slump that lasted for 23 years in a row. Unmeasured human misery that lasted for 23 years. If you look a little deeper at the history and what do you find? Well, at the time, the introduction of the steam engine was changing the nature of business and boosting the economic capacity of the global economy. And just as this new economy was emerging, Germany switched from using both gold and silver as money to accepting only gold. They stopped issuing silver coins, and many other countries followed suit. Sounds innocuous, but just as the world economy was moving to a whole new level of prosperity, the global supply of money shrank almost overnight. And suddenly, instead of the old parable of there being too much money chasing too few goods, right, which is an inflationary situation, there was far too little money chasing far too many goods. So the opposite of inflation, 
deflation. An industrial revolution, such as the invention of the steam engine, is usually deflationary all by itself because companies that adopt the new technology are able to provide things at a lower cost. They compete with each other and end up passing the benefits of the new technology on to their customers. Lower prices. But if you layer on top of that typical phenomenon, a monetary contraction, which is what happened in 1873, you have double the deflation risk. You might ask, why is deflation so bad? Well, imagine you're a company that owes the bank a lot of money. And the price you're charging for the stuff you're making is falling every month. Okay? Your revenue line is declining. Your ability to service your debt is evaporating before your very eyes. Even though you're still a viable business, the amount you owe the bank is fixed in nominal terms. It's not declining with all the other prices. Now, deflation interacts with debt in this way to create waves of corporate bankruptcies and job losses, which then lead to bank failures, and the financial system usually stops working. Even very promising companies find it impossible to obtain credit in that situation. Well, these are the characteristics of a depression, okay, where you get stuck there. It's very hard to get out of one. So what that historical example illustrates is that a sudden shock like a stock market crash, well, it could have almost no effect in certain conditions, or it may have profound, very long-term effects in other conditions. It depends on the underlying forces that are work, at work in the economy, and if they're the right ones, or in, in this case, the wrong ones, lead to an eruption of economic and financial volatility on a scale not seen before. Now, I believe that we're entering an age of rising economic and financial volatility. And the reason is that there are forces acting beneath the surface of the global economy that make us far more vulnerable to these black swan events than we were in the past. Forces just like the ones that produced the Victorian Depression. These forces that are in motion are so fundamental, they're kind of like forces of nature. There's almost nothing that you can do about them. I've actually come to think of them as tectonic in the same way you think of the forces acting beneath the Earth's crust, nothing you can do about those either. What they do is, when you least expect it, produce earthquakes. Now the COVID crisis, that one for sure, will become a very significant reference point in our economic history. It's for sure altered our perceptions of risk forever in the future. It's also changed our trajectory Okay, we're going a different place than we would have without it. Consider how work-life balance is shifting. From five long, arduous days per week at the office to some sort of hybrid model. Hybrid varies a lot from place to place, from company to company, but it'll all be hybrid. Consider how perceptions of inflation have been shaken up by this recent experience. 30 years, no inflation. All of a sudden, public enemy number one. Now, ironically, at the start of the pandemic, we were most worried about deflation. The consensus, in fact, was that we were facing the worst recession, quote, since the Great Depression. Okay, so in other words, the depression word was being used. And enduring the second Great Depression was a real possibility. Now, most people have forgotten all about this. After all, it's been almost two years. <laughs> But it's because of the rapid and effective policy making that went into preventing it. And since then, we've done a complete 180. Right? Instead of deflation, people are obsessed with inflation. And of course, central banks are responding. But that 180 has hit financial markets and the housing market really hard. And it's worth taking a moment to understand how we got into this mess as it connects directly to my central theme. So let's pretend just for a moment that Russia's invasion of Ukraine never happened. Suspend that. So when the pandemic hit, very few of us believed that fiscal policies would turn out to be as effective as they turned out to be. They did turn out to be really effective. And economies snapped back way faster than any economists expected. Now, I could say that I was one of the optimistic ones at the time, but they called me Sonny Steve, so I tried to su suppress that. 
The Economist called me Sonny Steve compared to Moody Mark, <laughs> which I always thought was a good thing. But in the middle of an emergency, it's not good to be just sound like too sunny. So we offered up bad scenarios as well as positive ones. And in the end, the best case scenario that we laid out in April of 2020 turned out to be the one that we lived through. And at the time, we thought it had very low odds of happening. This measured in terms of how the econ actual economic growth uh, unfolded and um, unemployment. Now, it looks like, looking back, because fiscal policy was so effective, Interest rates could have moved back to neutral, whatever that is exactly, I don't, won't say, but just above where they were, not zero, that's for sure, way sooner, even early 2021, okay? That's what it looks like now. It's easy to say. Remember, the most important risk that we were facing was deflation and how dreadful that could be, the depression that might come with it. And inflation had been below target for years in many countries for a long time. So central banks decided to hold interest rates very low. How long? Until inflation was returning to normal, not just when the economy turned back to normal. Now that strategy basically guaranteed that inflation would go above 2%. Now remember, Putin has not invaded Ukraine yet. But that, at that point there, those decisions meant for sure inflation was going to go above 2%. It's like heading for an intersection. It looks like it's going to be a red light but you wait until you actually get to the stop line before you take your foot off the gas, let alone touch the brake. You're guaranteed to go into the intersection, right? Even if you're squawking. All right, well, that's what we're talking about. Guaranteed. Now, that overshoot probably would have been modest. Maybe 3%, maybe 3.5%, who knows, but some modest number. But just at the wrong time, Putin did invade Ukraine. So here comes the other part of the story. Commodity prices skyrocketed. So that little inflation overshoot became a huge inflation overshoot. So there are two distinct inflation channels operating still today. And let's call it an internal one and an external one. And the external inflation drivers like rising commodity prices, shipping costs, all those supply chain things, they've all dissipated. They're all gone. So externally driven inflation is over. It's actually falling rapidly now. It'll fall even if prices remain high, right? That's how inflation is. I mean, if it's not moving, it stops moving, okay? Higher commodity prices never cause inflation because people stop buying the stuff because there's too big of a recession. The price falls back again. So these external drivers have all started to fall. Some of them are back to where they were before the pandemic. So this inflation channel, the one related to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, really is transitory. Okay, central banks have been chastised for calling something transitory that lasted too long. Well, transitory in the technical sense that economists actually use it, which is that it will go away by itself. Okay, give it all enough time. How long time? Well, we measure inflation on a year-over-year -year basis. When the price goes up, this price, I'm gonna do it for you. Like so, the price goes up for 12 months in a row, inflation's high, because the base is below where you are. And then 12 months later, the price in the base jumps up. And then inflation is back to zero again, right? That's just how we calculate. So it has to take 12 months. And if it takes a year for those commodity prices to reach a peak, it'll take two full years for it to disappear from the year-on-year -year growth rate. That's just arithmetic. Try and explain it to a journalist. It doesn't really go that well. <laughs> okay? So, but the problem was that when you say to a journalist, that'll be transitory. They write down, it's transitory. Next month, it'll be gone. <laughs> uh, no, that's not what we meant. It's too bad. It's been written now. And now you can't use the T word. I still use the T word. I'm still club transitory. Because I think inflation will fall to probably below 4% all by itself. Because all that we be left is that original overshoot that I described before. That could take another six, nine months. I don't know exactly. But what we know is that the task will be to move inflation not from eight or nine or 10% down to 2%. It's to move inflation from something below 4% down to 
down to the 1% to 3% range. That already sounds easier, right? Is a recession necessary to achieve that? No. But a stagflationary scenario where we don't grow much, but inflation is high, hopefully declining, well, that's stagflation. Stagflation is high and you got, you know, unemployment and stuff like this because you're kind of keeping it under control. Stagflation is actually the best that we can hope for now. Okay. Now, just using the word stagflation, I know there's too many young people here to have lived in stagflation, but it conjures up images of the 1970s. And so it's fair to ask whether history, therefore, is about to repeat itself. And now we can get back to that main theme. Because in the early 1970s, unemployment was rising. This is when I graduated from high school. People like me were just coming out of the job market. In my class back at, uh, at Central, uh, Central Collegiate back in Oshawa, 1974, I'm pretty sure only two or maybe three of us went on to university. Everybody else went to work for what we, we all call generous motors. Okay, not everybody, but, but a lot. So, but they were entering the workforce at a time when there were layoffs aplenty and there was, there was rising unemployment. So I talked about this in my valedictorian address in high school in 1974. It turned out to be my first economics uh, talk. <laughs> I hadn't even started taking economics yet. I just, just, uh, just going to school then, gone down to Queens. But the job market did look quite grim for that graduating class and very few of us were heading to university, so this was Oshawa. They were going to General Motors, if they could. Central banks were keeping interest rates low because rising unemployment means you should try, try to grow the economy and create jobs for all these young folks that were entering the market. And the models they were using at the time said inflation never rises when unemployment is rising. And yet what happened? What happened was the great inflation of the 1970s that spread worldwide and took more than a decade, a mistake to correct. In other words, out of benign circumstances came a life-altering economic event. And the reason is that a major force was operating beneath the surface of the global economy. I'll call it the youthification of the workforce. I don't even know if that's a real word, but you know what I mean. So the workforce was getting younger at that precise moment in time for about 20 years. Now this spectacular failure on the part of the economics profession prompted John Kenneth Galbraith, great, econom great Canadian economist who was at Harvard, to write his great book, The Age of Uncertainty. Economics was completely redeveloped and inflation targets for central banks was one of the consequences of that rethink. Now, the similarities of the 70s to our current situation prompted me to write my little book, which I called The Next Age of Uncertainty, always piggyback on another great title. <laughs> but today, those very same baby boomers from the 1970s, the very same people, okay, are retiring from the workforce in droves. And what are companies saying? They're complaining about a worker shortage. Unemployment is very low. There's excess job vacancies. Central banks are reading this as a harbinger of higher inflation down the road. But what if the signal coming from the labor market today is just as misleading as it was in the early 1970s, only in reverse? Is it possible that the aging of the workforce today will lead to exactly the same kind of error that was made when the workforce was getting younger? 50 years ago. I think it might. And if so, then inflation could actually fall faster than markets believe today. If I'm right about that, what the labor market is telling us today is that we've switched from having too many workers over the past 50 years to too few. And the too few is actually our new normal and in fact is the historical normal, except for that 50-year bulge after World War II. The implications for the economy could be profound, if I'm right. The new sustainable path for the economy would see higher wages because of worker shortages, lower profit margins from firms because they have to pay higher wages, 
And to try and tie a bow on that, more investment by companies in labor-saving equipment and technology, therefore higher productivity. Some combination of those three things will give us a new sustainable path with this lower population growth. Misreading the situation, just as we did in the early 1970s, runs the risk of disrupting that natural process. Well, I offer that up just as an illustration of how a tectonic force acting beneath the surface of the economy can affect standard, almost completely intuitive economic analysis. The aging of our workforce is a very predictable phenomenon. I'll just illustrate for you how easy this is since we're at a university. I can be a, I can be a professor for a minute. And here we go. If we all get together for a dinner one year from now, we will all be one year older. Now that's the end of the demographics lesson. This is almost as good as economics jokes can get, I'm afraid. Uh, lawyer jokes are way funnier, I gotta say. But now that I'm with the law firm, I rarely tell them anymore. It's just, just not done. But for the past 50 years, economists generally assumed that demographics were not in motion, because they actually weren't. Or at least they were moving so slowly they just don't matter to your forecast. Well, that was then, and this is now. The global workforce, the global workforce, is aging very rapidly today. And its growth rate, the actual number of people available to actually work, that growth rate is slowing a lot. Population growth is the most important ingredient of trend global economic growth. Okay. So that trend in global economic growth is slowing and will do so for the foreseeable future. By that I mean in generational terms. Now for a country like Canada, first response, these consequences can be delayed by increasing immigration. But the entire world is aging at exactly the same time. Other countries are gonna reach that same conclusion, just as we do. We'll have to compete for those immigrants. It's not gonna be just like, oh, let's take this many, let's take this many. So the aging of the population is just the first of the five tectonic forces that I identify in the book. And these forces all have similarly disruptive effects on our lives over the next 10 to 20 years. I'll quickly touch them. The second tectonic force, technological progress. It's always there, you see that every day. But there have only been three big waves in history of technological change. We call them industrial revolutions, hugely disruptive. That's the steam engine, you know, electrification, and the computer chip. These are general purpose technologies that affect everything that you do, not just one segment. Now, we've just entered, not long ago, the fourth industrial revolution, which is the digitization of everything. Associated developments in AI, huge advances in biotech. Look how they got the, the vaccines in just a few months. This, this is what digitization is doing for us. Well, this is clearly a force for good but it's widely believed that 15% at least of global workers will be disrupted, global workers. The third tectonic force, growing income inequality. We know it's there. You see it all around. It's usually a side effect of an industrial revolution. In fact, most of what we see of rising income inequality is the product of the third industrial revolution, right? the computer chip revolution. People feel left behind. What happens? Politicians tap into that layer of discontent. We get political polarization, a drift towards populism. This has happened every time in history. We see it in recent geopolitical stresses. You know, I'll just mention a few names, Trump, Johnson. Populism in general in Europe, deglobalization, disintegration of international collaboration, these are all symptoms of a polarization in politics and inability to come together. The share of income globally going to workers is at its lowest point in all of economic history, all the data that are available. This is the sort of situation that will, in past episodes, give rise to 
revolutions. So clearly an inflection point is arising. Stress from this source is clearly going up right now. And I think politics may be incapable of creating a consensus around a solution. Joe Biden got elected partly on, I'm going to fix this income inequality problem. Hasn't happened yet. The fourth force, rising debt. Don't have to say much about that. Government debt in particular has exploded during the pandemic. We are now at a, a roughly the same place globally as we were right after World War II. Okay. It's clearly a force to be reckoned with. After World War II, we had a boom in population to help us pay for it. Not this time. Fifth, climate change. More specifically, the forced energy transition to net zero emissions by 2050. It's going to be a highly disruptive change in the way we do things. So far, completely undefined. I could think right here, five or six different paths to 2050. And we have no way of choosing between them if you're planning a business. A coherent plan is likely to be beyond political capability, as we're seeing at COP27. And I'll just remind you, they call it COP27 because it's the 27th time they've tried to do this. That's how hard it is. Now, these five tectonic forces happen to be all growing in power at exactly the same time. And it's possible to think of each one of those tectonic forces by itself like we did with population aging a few minutes ago. But because of all five are rising in strength at the same time, they can interact with each other. They can magnify each other. The situation is actually far more complex than can be managed by standard economic models. Now, economists, here's something for their side. They're never ca happy with casual empiricism right, or simple correlations in the data. An economist demands that there be a rigorous theory in behind their interpretation, something that tied together coherently with mathematics. Well, then they test that theory by subjecting it to empirical analysis. And if the data don't support it, they reject it. But if it withstands those tests, it lives on until someday it doesn't, like what happened in the, to the models in the 1970s. Now, probably the worst criticism that you can level at an economist is to say that they're using economic data the way a drunk uses a streetlight, which is for support, not for illumination. Now, there's an exotic branch of mathematics that I won't go into, and it's called chaos theory, really well named. But what it does is it analyzes complex nonlinear systems, which is what economies are. And this is what we would have if we tried to create a theoretical model that captured all five of those tectonic forces. They're beyond typical models. But chaos theory is very well named. It concludes that when a system of nonlinear forces, like the five I've mentioned, are in motion and interact with each other, the system will deliver chaotic outcomes. And what does that mean? It means that our economy, when these forces are moving, can generate completely inexplicable observations. Even if you know they already happened, you will not be able to reconcile them with your underlying framework because they're totally random. So this is what the theory that underlies the so-called butterfly effect that you've heard of. A uh, more common example is when you're flying in a plane, it's perfectly clear, you can see out the window, it's a beautiful blue sky, nothing going on up there, and suddenly, inexplicably, we encounter clear air turbulence. So that kind of turbulence amounts to a black swan. It arises from the interaction of the curves of the plane, the nonlinearities, with the air, which looks innocent, benign. No model can predict it, it just happens. And that's why they tell you to leave your seatbelt fastened whenever you're sitting down. Now I'm predicting that these five tectonic forces will grow during the next 10 to 20 years and interact with each other, creating bouts of inexplicable economic and financial volatility. And since these events, when they happen, will be totally inexplicable, ex ante or ex post, people will call them black swans just as they did for the Victorian Depression or the global financial crisis. What this analysis suggests is there will be more frequent recessions and booms, bouts of inflation and deflation, much higher probability of losing your job, more company bankruptcies, 
much more financial volatility from interest rates to stock markets to exchange rates. Now the COVID crisis gives us a case study. Policy making rose to the occasion, private sector adapted quickly. There are many lessons from that experience. But people who conclude from that experience that governments will just be sitting there ready to ma manage all this future volatility I'm predicting, I think will be disappointed. First of all, remember the, the downtrend in, in global economic growth. That's part of the demographic story. Well, that also means that real rates of interest are going to stay low after we're through this, whatever this episode ends up like. Monetary policy won't have room to maneuver, in other words. Fiscal policy, totally constrained by this debt hangover plus the rising fiscal burden of an aging population. And of course, political polarization will make policy consensus around the kinds of things that we're worried about very hard to achieve, increasingly hard. Even today, we're demonstrating that there's very little that we can agree upon. So I conclude from this that these higher levels of risk that I'm talking about are gonna wash up on the doorsteps of ordinary people and the companies they work for. So just a couple of insights from this line of thinking. What will it take us? The first thing is, the long-term outlook for inflation is much riskier than it has been for the past 30 years. This risk comes from the combination of the debt legacy and populist politics. Just too tempting to inflate the debt away. It's a strong incentive for governments to favor this. We go back to the 1970s. We had a huge inflation that went global. Who won in that? You know, highly indebted governments got their debts erased, and highly indebted households with big mortgages, you know, like my parents, let's say. Well, you know, that, there's a ruckus right now over inflation, but that's because people haven't figured out who wins and who loses. Right now, it feels like everybody's a loser, which is great. Uh, that means the chances are we're going to fix this one, but the risk will remain after it's over. If we get to the stage that I'm talking about, households will figure it out. They might even vote for a populist leader who is saying, let's have some more inflation, like in Turkey. Second, there will be much more labor market churn, structural dislocation, therefore more unemployment on average. And I think households will be more financially fragile than ever before. They'll be more financially conservative as a way to protect themselves against that but their decisions around housing and finance will be far riskier than they are today. Now we know that financial intermediaries, as we know them here in Canada, are not exactly risk lovers. Let's put it uh, mildly, okay? It could make it even harder for us to get the kind of credit we expect to get, to get through our life plan. But actually I'm hopeful that in this stress situation I'm describing, they'll become innovators. They will innovate and especially in the business of housing finance, where we, are, we really do need some innovation. But when all is said and done, I think it's gonna be companies that will be the central players that help us manage through this risk. Company churn will ratchet higher, that's to begin with. But what I mean by churn is, you know, companies will go out of business and come into business more often. Most people don't realize that here in Canada, we lose about 40,000 companies every single month. Think about that. 40,000 companies every single month. But the good news is that we also create about 41,000 companies every single month. Now this kind of churn is a very positive thing because it means dead wood's getting cleared out and new wood is growing, you know, it's like, like forest management, same deal. So the population of companies has been growing net, okay? ever since the, the low point during the pandemic. This is Schumpeter's creative destruction in action, and the higher it is, actually, the more positivity that can come out of it. What I think is the level of creative destruction will be on a rising trend for the next 10 or 20 years. This is gonna make the business environment a lot more volatile. Now, I'm sure it would not have escaped your notice that every company bankruptcy and every company creation requires legal services. And these services would cover the gamut of firm-specific needs, but I have no doubt also that our legal frameworks would come under considerable strain. It's just like you got a plumbing system, you decide you're going to have three more bathrooms in your house. Okay, You can put the system under strain. 
Now, our legal system is ill-equipped to manage things today. I mean, just as our health infrastructure is ill-equipped to manage through a pandemic, let alone seasonal surges in respiratory illnesses. And I'm describing an environment that can only put our system, the legal system, under more strain. Now, on law and order, okay, the crime takes maybe five minutes. It gets solved in around 20 minutes, most Thursday nights. And then justice takes about another 20 minutes. If only it could be this way in real life. Anyway, drilling down to the company level, risks will feel tangible, and the channels of adaptation will vary a lot from company to company. But mention a few things. Companies will carry bigger financial buffers, just like people will. And they'll begin to think about risk management as an actual activity, an output for the company convert risk into value for shareholders, and shareholders will reward them if they do a good job of that. They'll hold capital in reserve, not just to defend against downside risks, but to be ready to capitalize on an upside risk. Investors and financial intermediaries will force ESG accountability on the companies. We're already seeing that now with the E and the G, and I'm arguing that the S will be next because market power in this world will shift from employer to employee. We're already seeing that in the wake of the pandemic. Workers are resisting the return to work in the office full time. And around half of Canadian workers are looking for a different job. And they actually believe they're gonna find one because there are so many vacancies. Now, since the pandemic, we've talked about the K-shaped economy, where the top part of the K is there everything great happening. Bond part of the K is where people were shut down, right? And, and by, by September or October of 2020, there was only 2 to 3 percent of the economy in the bottom part of the K, even though that's all you read about in the newspaper. The top 97 or 98 percent was not just sitting there, it was growing and creating new jobs and attracting people who were laid off in the bottom part of the K. And that's why when we turned the bottom part of the K back on, there's a shortage of workers, okay? It's actually a good sign that this happened. Well, as the fourth industrial revolution progresses, people who are disrupted by the technology are gonna struggle in that bottom part of the K. Those at the top will keep doing well. But we take that shortage of workers and acknowledge that and we'll overlay that on a K-shaped labor market, companies will wanna work harder and harder to maintain a loyal workforce. They'll help workers transition from the bottom part of the K to the top. That will foster loyalty for life. And shareholders will know only the companies that make those investments in people are gonna be the ones that succeed. Otherwise, I think they'll face a renaissance of labor unions, and we may see that anyway in the conditions I'm describing. Employees will face higher volatility, of course, more fluctuations in employment and wages and interest rates and house prices and all those things. And so companies will find it advantageous to find ways to help them reduce those risks that affect their lives. So I'm expecting things like a broader menu of compensation choices. Maybe the defined benefit pension plan will see a renaissance. I wouldn't be surprised. But by now, I've taken you on quite a trip from the stresses of the pandemic and war to a more speculative future that actually may be more grim than calm. So it's time for me to wrap up. So I know from experience that people don't really like to hear that they're facing a rising tide of risk. People just don't like risk. But if you study history as I have, you'll be reminded that volatility is always two-sided. It comes in the form of bad luck, of course but it also comes in the form of good luck. And in fact, the most important lesson of economic history is that good luck has always outweighed bad luck, on average, over time. Now, preparing for volatility means being ready to defend against bad luck, but being ready to capitalize on good luck. And economists and their models will be of only modest assistance in the environment I'm describing. Economic models, and forecasts are all based on average historical behavior. They're based on bell curves of probability. You've all heard about those. But those bell curves are becoming flatter and wider, covering many more possibilities. It tells us more about the range of possibilities than about what is most likely. In that world, economic forecasts will become unuseful 
but scenario planning will become very useful. Now let me illustrate in closing with a parable. You imagine a CEO comes to a river. A company has to cross the river to keep moving forward. The CEO calls upon the chief economist, of course, most trusted advisor, as well as his chief counsel, also a very trusted advisor. Please opine. The chief counsel sees a lot of risk crossing the river, like 14, 15 important risks, but concludes that yes, admits there's no legal risk, we're allowed to go across and we're allowed to operate on the other side. Chief economist thinks carefully and says, boss, it's okay, you can just walk across that river. I estimate it's only 12 inches deep on average. <laughs> now the smart CEO will ask for some scenario planning. And one of those scenarios will be that the river is around 60 feet deep in the middle. So the entire firm will invest first in swimming lessons, and then they will walk across. We face the next stage of uncertainty, but I've every reason to think that good luck will continue to outweigh bad luck, at least on average. And that is, in fact, the most important lesson of our history. That's how we got here. Thank you. Well, thank you. So we have a few minutes, so I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, gentleman over there has a microphone. If you could use the microphone for those on the live stream. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for your uh, discussion. Thanks for coming to the University of Saskatchewan. Of course, uh, we're not in an economics uh, environment, but um, we've had a former governor of the Bank of Canada, Mr. Gordon Thiessen, uh, who did his, both his undergrad and graduate uh, master's here. Yep. Um, and we actually appreciate that uh, you paid tribute to him in uh, your last monetary policy review. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, quite a tribute. In um, Mr. Thiessen's first, moni or first monetary policy review in 95, he spoke about reducing uh, one kind of uncertainty, which I thought was interesting given the title of your discussion this morning, and it was broad-ranging, your mm -hmm. discussion. Um, the uns and he wanted to reduce the uncertainty, I mean, amongst other things, of course. He introduced fixed dates and, and yep. on and on. Um, but with the objective of improving the operation of financial markets and of the economy generally. That, that was, in fact, why Mr. Thiessen came up with this monetary policy review. Mm -hmm. Because your discussion here was so broad-ranging, I, I, can't, I can't really address, there's so many things to address. The first and the obvious one would be that labor caused the inflation of the 70s. Um, I've, I've got the head of the London School of Economics Department uh, that would disagree with you in uh, very robust terms. And, and I, I myself, I mean, it, it just generally, I think um, that was a, in my view, and I'm not going to debate it here, but that was a, a, a supply problem. Oil prices played a role. I don't think labor was what was driving inflation. Yeah, I didn't say labor drove inflation either. I said a mistake in interpreting the labor market caused central banks to cause inflation. Well, um, I know it's broad ranging and I, I don't want to have a, a, a okay. long, I do want to have ask well, one I'll, question. I'll just correct you when you make a mistake. That's, That's fine. All. I'm doing the same with yeah. you. All right. Uh, so on, um, and, and to say that inflation is being driven today by labor, which was implied. Which I didn't say either. Um, In fact, I'm, I'm saying the opposite. Okay. Um, well, you were saying that, um, well, okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that would be helpful would be to decouple, you know, and get a little bit more specific on um, commodities generally. And I, I kind of want to direct this towards the local Saskatchewan economy, mm -hmm. um, seeing as you're here in Saskatchewan. Okay. Um, food prices 
are pretty much inelastic. Um, so to talk about commodities generally, um, I think you need to decouple in the current age that we're, that we're, uh, th th that we're sitting in today uh, from those types of commodities. And of course, this massively benefits uh, Saskatchewan. Um, and, and tied to that, I think you could take a look at the fiscal error, policy errors that were made that drove inflation 2021, for example, starting out in the States, let's use it as an example, at 1.4%. Putin was nowhere to be found by the end of the year, yet inflation was so, already... So, so, do you have a question? Because we have three other people behind you. We only have yep. about 10 minutes. Yep, for so sure. question, please. So, as far as the Saskatchewan economy is concerned, um, a lot of the forces that play a role in other regions don't really affect us. So, we've got um, commodities, um, future-facing commodities, as the BHP uh, CEO BHP Billiton was put that would put them. A lot of the factors that are playing uh, a role or these uncertainties don't exist here in Saskatchewan. And I would like to go on, but I will shorten it for this. Uh, and sorry if I've gone on too long. Um, can you comment on those uh, on on that scenario and the maybe the lack of uncertainty that exists here? in Saskatchewan. Interest rate risk, for example, doesn't really play a massive role in Saskatchewan when you're producing food and fertilizer. So I'd, I'd, I'm interested to get, um, well, it's typically mortgage-related interest rate risk. So with a small population, it doesn't have an impact. So I'd just be interested if you've thought about um, the Saskatchewan economy and maybe the lack of uncertainty in uh, the region here. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, obviously, there's too much in there to unpack, but I'll just focus on the last part. I would just say in passing that the, that famous uh, monetary policy report that was written in 1995 wasn't written by Gordon Teeson, it was written by me. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I was part of the team that developed all that, so I was there, and, and Gordon and I are good friends. So, all to say that I didn't come here today to explain all about today's, if I could spend my entire time about today's situation. What I was trying to do is connect it and the potential for error uh, to the underlying forces that I'm, that I'm describing. Because after all, this episode will be over before too long, and uh, then we'll be worried about the future again. Um, in terms of Saskatchewan, very lucky uh, place uh, at this time, as you mentioned, and the three-legged stool of human existence, food, water, energy. Uh, well, food's a really important one, and, and uh, not only do you grow the food, but you also create one of the most ingre important ingredients, which is the fertilizer side of that, of that stool. Uh, you know, I would just disagree. All the things I talked about in terms of risk will be very present uh, here just as they are everywhere else. Uh, just we may only have 500,000 people, but that means that 250,000 of them live in houses with mortgages. They have just as much interest rate risk as the millions in Ontario. Uh, that doesn't change that. So, uh, but you are blessed with natural resources that people agree are good. However, not necessarily un not under threat, that is that, oh, there's too many emissions created in the production of fertilizer, so somehow we've got to reduce that, reduce the use of fertilizer. These are the kinds of arbitrary things that come from that path, the various paths to 2050, which add risk to everybody. And I think that what we need is some clarity on that, things like we can produce energy forever if we meet net, net zero, if we create uh, the, uh, be a leader in carbon capture technology, those kinds of things are not being said at this time. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, in our sectors, even the ones we're blessed with, the, uh, the uh, endowments of natural resources. So uh, you've covered a lot of ground. I can't begin to, uh, <laughs> but you know, I'll just say you came armed with a copy of my book and got me to sign it. That's really nice, so good, good on you. Clean. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for a, a really interesting talk, Mr. Polos. Um, just a quick question about uh, monetary policy and the, the Bank of Canada's shift from, a, from inflation targeting to a, a blend of inflation targeting and employment. Uh, yeah. How does that work in, in practicality? And, and, and uh, can you explain uh, the shift uh, to, the, to the audience? Yeah, there, there actually isn't a shift. 
Uh, it's, it's very carefully orchestrated there. In the banks thinking there is really only one uh, level of maximum employment, that, which is what's referred to, uh, which is also consistent with stable inflation, right? So this we, we call we call that that you, there's a unique relationship between those. So employment was always part of the calculus of where are you and where will you end up. Of course, the the what we call the natural rate of unemployment or U star or whatever you want to call it is kind of a moving number. So it it, it varies with underlying by the shifts I'm describing. So the natural rate of unemployment rose a lot in the 70s, and that was the mistake that was made. And I'm arguing that it's probably dropped now, and it's a mistake that could be made now by overreacting to it uh, when they, they're not appreciating that only part way would be the right thing. And hopefully that the data and the adjustment of the economy, the fall in inflation will happen quickly enough that they realize that before the mistake actually becomes real. Policy is made differently nowadays. So reconciling those two is, is pretty straightforward uh, in the bank's uh, lens uh, that we will only, we're, when, when everything's fine, like it was just before the pandemic, inflation was at 2%, exactly 2%, and unemployment was at a 40-year low. Can't think of a better place to be if we're going to get hit by something unexpected, right? Once you were there, then you could say, well, look, let's just push the system a little bit and see if we can get a little bit lower sustainable unemployment now that we're starting from that position. But you can't have that kind of conversation when inflation is 7% and even if it's falling rapidly. You can't begin to think that way until you get there. And they say, there, job one is done. Now job two is let's see if the system can generate a higher sustainable level of unemployment. And what that what it does is it works away at that un the, the income inequality aspect and makes it more, this is how the Americans discovered it, right? Same thing, it was like inflation stayed low and low, it kept going down a little, going down further. And so that, that's, that's part of their mandate too, but more explicitly there than here. It's a little bit of a question of balance, but ultimately most economists think there's a fairly unique combination. Next question. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Willows, for uh joining us and speaking with the young people to especially. Um, students, have classes. students have classes. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, the government of Canada is openly uh, talking about creating a digital currency uh, yep. through the Bank of Canada. Yes. And I wanted you to comment briefly on that and whether you've captured the rise of crypto in your technological tectonic forces. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a little bit of a sideshow, to be honest. Um, and I said that long before they started disappearing, uh, evaporating before your very eyes. Uh, so like, I think it was three years ago, I said that Bitcoin would had a natural price of zero. So someday it would go there. And of course, that's yeah, pretty well, almost more than halfway there now. So it's <laughs> forecast. It was like $68,000 at one point when I think when I said that. So anyway. Never mind, that doesn't matter about the forecasting. It's just about what is the value proposition of a digital currency? And if it's got one, then that's great. I mean, for sure, there's an underlying technology there, which offers a lot. The technology is being used in lots of great applications now. Just to name one, you know, if you used to, used to go over to Istanbul and you could, you could buy like a $5,000 handbag for like $200 because it fell off the truck or something like that. But now those $5,000 handbags are being registered on a, on a blockchain so that they can't fall off the truck, okay? They can't be illegitimate ones. They're either on the blockchain or they're not on the blockchain. Well, this is, this is true genius, right? This is, this is, uh, this is amazing. So, so uh, all kinds of tokens can be created that have true value behind them. Bitcoin just doesn't have to be one of them, okay? has no value proposition, unless you're in the underworld where that's a, it's a currency which is in use, and if you want to do that, fine, we'll find a way to blow it up someday, and then, and then you'll, be, you'll be in a problem. But anyway, uh, we will, though, have digital currencies issued by central banks if people want them. I mean, have you got any cash on you? No. No cash at all? Literally none. Literally none. So you're a candidate. You're going to want... You're going to want to have something, your phone or, or a, some sort of a smart card or a, like in Sweden, a little chip embedded in your wrist that allows you to, to tap and go. 
And that's all great, but un underneath that will be a Canadian dollar, not a Bitcoin or some other thing like that, and there's only one legitimate issuer of that. So once there is one, I think other competing uh, technologies will get blown out, just like you can't put out your own currency and try to get people on campus to use it, right? Because they're gonna be like, no, I trust the Canadian dollar, why would I use your currency? Oh, because Armageddon's coming, and I, I, you, you, my currency will be the only one that's worth anything. Well, not a lot of people are gonna listen to that, okay? And so it'll get blown away, uh, and so in the end, it's all about being ready, and central banks are virtually ready now. So it's more a question of when is the timing right to introduce these things. So it's going to happen, but again, as I, I, I don't see it as, that's an interesting technology, uh, and it'll be used side by side with current payment system, the way we use cash today. So, okay, two questions left. Two uh, questions left, and I'll be quick, I promise. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be Sorry, quick I haven't if you're quick. Voice yet. Uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, you know I can appreciate that uh, as a former governor of a central bank, I, I think you do have the coolest job ever. <laughs> I just had to say that. But it's pretty uh, cool. My, yeah. Yeah, it was. I'm sure. But <laughs> it was. Um, my question's pretty like simple. It's just one of the points you made almost in passing. Uh -huh. So you observed that um, with respect to like the bad inflation outlook that we have, which I think we're all on the same page about. Um, one of the only nice things about inflation is that it can kind of erase debt because when you're paying back debt and we're really over leveraged across the board, yeah. um, you're paying it back with, you know, the purchasing power has changed and it's advantageous to those with a lot of debt. But in that, making that point, you also mentioned that populist candidates will say something to the effect of, you know, um, let's have more inflation. And I just... I'm really curious about that point. Um, we have, you know, Trump running back again and yeah. he's back on Twitter and everything. And yeah. I just don't know how, like, how does that fit into like campaign messaging? And <laughs> it doesn't sound like a good, it, it doesn't sound like something that, you know, any well, politician can say, let's have more inflation. I'm just curious okay. about what the connection is. So like it, it does, it connects to uh, the first questioner, okay, who, who, who mischaracterized my, my, how labor caused inflation either then or now, neither one is the case. Inflation in the, uh, the, the late 1960s was the product of a Fed that got pushed around get politically. Let's keep interest rates low for longer. We're having trouble paying for the Vietnam War. If rates go up, that's gonna cost us a ton of money to service the debt. And the Fed allowed itself to be pushed around, okay? So when, they, when in public, what they said was unemployment's rising. Of course, we're gonna keep interest rates low, okay? So it was a mistake on the data, which is today, we we'll maybe make a similar mistake the opposite way. But it comes from governments pushing their central banks around. That's, that's the history of governments. Governments incur the debts, and they would love to have an inflation to erase them. So clipping of coins, the history of money, you know, and making the coins have less gold in them so you can have more coins, and those were all creating inflation out in the, uh, in the economy because then the government, the king or whatever, could get away with uh, more spending. That's why central banks were created, to clip that risk, to stop it, okay? And so, but they're still politically appointed and over, overseen, and so there's always the scope for maybe a little nudging or pushing around behind the scenes. And uh, like even the Bank of Canada is not legally independent, not statutorily independent. It's this inflation objective thing, which we agree to, and they would have to say, Bank of Canada, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. And they have to write it down and table it in Parliament, and the governor, in good conscience, usually would resign, since they would have had the opportunity to agree to it before they tabled it in Parliament. That's a pretty good independence kind of arrangement, but it's not perfect, okay? So all I'm saying is that the risk, the temptation for governments to come along and say, a candidate would say, you know, they're really fussed about this 2% inflation. Is 2% really that important? Like, what if, four, what if it's 4%? Really? I mean, that's not bad. That's pretty close to 2. I'm in favor of them holding rates now and not raising unemployment further. You know, that sounds pretty good to regular folks, right? If they've got to renew their mortgage, they don't want it to be another 100 basis points higher or 200 basis points higher. So they would vote for that. If they start agreeing with 4%, well, what's wrong with 5%? It's just a little bit higher. It's not much, it's only for a little while. You know, this is what happens. 
So that temptation is always there for governments, and that's why central banks are made independent to prevent it. So that's, that's all I'm arguing, that we're in a, a kind of a toxic cocktail situation here where we need to be more aware of those risks. And I think people like millennials never, didn't live through it like the rest of us did. They didn't live with a 20% mortgage rate. You, know, you think, well, that's, a, a, that's un, it's impossible. No, it isn't. <laughs> okay? So uh, a little history is all it is. It's, uh, it's just learning that in the, the history where inflation has been under control is actually really short. It's only been about 30 years in the big sweep. Last question. Last one. With the, international, with the internationalization of the financial markets and instruments, how do you compare the capacity of governments to regulate and oversee the financial institutions that are no longer dominated by national actors? Yeah. Well, so uh, we believe we've, we've taken steps to manage that risk. Uh, through what we call the Basel Committee, which is uh, a group based on the central banks uh, who are members of the Bank for International Settlements. And so we made a global body. And so the Basel III agreement was meant to uh, compensate for all the shortcomings that gave rise to the global financial crisis, certainly in the central banking system. Everybody agreed on that, and so everybody went back home and then implemented the changes. So today's uh, uh, global financial infrastructure is far more resilient than the one prior to 2007, 2008. Um, and, and it's not, but we know it's not perfect. The parallel, you know, shadow banking system is largely unregulated uh, by that. Their linkages with the rest are regulated. So that's to say we've taken big steps to internationalize that architecture. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's it's a order of magnitude more effective than the one we had before that crisis. And after, after Cayman Islands and crypto, where to stash the cash? <laughs> yeah. Well, there will always be kind of rogue places where you can go, uh, and, and that's, that's okay, too. I mean, uh, most of us won't all flock to the Caymans to manage our affairs, you know, so there'll, but there will be some. Of course, there always has been. That's always been the case, and the system has managed pretty well for the past 70 years, you know, with, without shutting all that down. We always hope to persuade them to be part of it, you know. Uh, but yeah, there will always be, the, the, the basic thing here is you don't want to suppress all innovation in order to have a perfectly controlled system. It's like that for crypto. You don't want to just shut it all down, so you don't want it to be the Wild West. And we get a little bit of Wild West, right? So. Um, because our regulators have really lagged that, uh, that uh, development. You mentioned high risks washing up on our doorstep. Was that yes. a reference to rising sea levels? <laughs> it's, a, it's a metaphor that works in more than one way. <laughs> Thank you. OK, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the college and the McCurcha Lecture Series, I just want to thank Stephen Polos for a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much.